Thanks, Brian. Um, just so I'll be on camera, you guys can also be in my little uh, room here. <laughs> uh, but I plan on turning that off during the course, just a heads up. Um, so this course is actually going to be run locally. Um, it's meant to provide an introduction to um, R for people that are familiar with SAS. Um, so we'll be going over some useful packages, um, such as like formatting, uh, some frequencies, and uh, we'll go through like a basic logistic regression example at the end of the course. Um, so for right now, I'm going to put this in the chat. And if you guys wouldn't mind just um, sharing my screen. Hopefully this is the right one. I hope that everybody has it. <laughs> okay, great. So if you go to that link within the chat, um, you should be able to see the GitHub account here. Um, pretty much if you go here, click the code button and download these zip files. That'll get you set up with all the material within the course. Um, so if you go back and kind of just extract that where you would want. I'll put this here on my desktop. And just show the extract button. Okay. Uh, so here should be all the files that you would need. Um, we organize those. There's two main CSV files. Um, the one we'll be working with the most in the class is called COVID. Um, so thank you, Dr. Higgins, for providing that. Um, it's a good repository. Um, and then we just have our basic PowerPoint here. Um, if we go ahead and open that up, um, we'll get started here. Um, just as a heads up, uh, we are gonna be working locally with this. So if you guys all wanna go down to slide six, um, that'll get the installation started for your R uh, studio, and you can download R um, from the repositories there. Uh, Host locally on CRAN. Estimate statements. Um, can you be a little bit more specific with that? So sometimes with R, um, it'll provide an estimate, but SAS will not. Um, so there's a little bit of an overlap there, I would say. Can you provide a little bit more clarity, I guess, before we get started? Like a like a contrast statement for getting um, the LS means or something like that. Usually, instead of doing an LS mean in SAS, I'll use the estimate statements to get it a little more specific. Um, so generally, when dealing with like summary statistics, um, you can get most things out of like a summary function. Um, but um, if you're looking for like some advanced statistics, I would say, um, depending on what you're doing, um, I provide, I guess, a reference to the psych package. Um, so you should be able to kind of use the psych package a little bit for some of those estimates. I think that would be a good resource. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, just as a heads up, a reminder again, uh, let's kind of get this going with the, uh, the downloads. Um, I guess let's get rolling. It should take about 10 minutes to download. Essentially, you're gonna be needing to download R and then the R Studio um, for the IDE. Um, you can download those anywhere and then uh, help navigate to the directory where we put these files. Okay. So you guys should all be able to see my screen. Uh, this is SAS to R for medicine. Um, again, this is supposed to be providing an introduction to R uh, for SAS users. Um, so we'll go over some basic functionality there. Um, my name is Joe. Um, I'm a data science consultant here for Procagia. Um, and we focus on a lot of different uh, data science solutions, uh, mainly with like our server studio installations, uh, some data engineering in the cloud. And we also have some people with more statistics based backgrounds. Uh, and just for what we have on the agenda today, um, we have an introduction, so we'll go through the intro of like what R is, um, kind of how that relates to SAS a little bit. Um, we'll go in through some basic um, reading out of our data, uh, kind of focus a little bit on some data wrangling and some packages there. Um, there are some ggplot examples um, that I provided in an R file. Um, if you're looking to um, kind of look into more visualizations, I guess, we only cover a little bit of a basic scatter plot in this course, um, but for some people that, uh, that might be of interest to them. Um, and then we'll go through some data exploration. And then finally, we'll just do a little walk through with uh, just like a logistic model um, and kind of establishing a base fit there. Okay. So just as a reminder of like a code of conduct, um, this is meant to brought up as early as possible. Um, there's gonna be no harassment between the course um, participants as well as the instructor. 
Um, so there's like a no tolerance policy here um, at our medicine. Um, if you're looking for the complete link for the code of conduct, that's provided in the link below. Um, so feel free to explore that if you wish. Um, there's also a limitation for no screenshots or recordings um, or any type of photographs as well during this presentation. Um, and I think that carries over to all um, presenters and instructors as well. So, all right. So the introduction. So essentially what is R? Um, R is an open source programming language um, that was developed essentially just for statistical analysis. Um, and R Studio is kind of the most frequently and freely available integrated development environment. So that's known as an IDE uh, for some people that aren't familiar with that. Um, essentially, that's just a more friendly user interface, right? So we can run R through like a terminal or a command line, um, but kind of executing our code and somewhere that's a little bit more, uh, more friendly to the eye is, is ideal. And just a, kind of like a quote, um, if programming in R is like driving a car, then you can think of R as an engine under the hood. Um, and essentially R Studio is like the steering wheel, the accelerator, the brake pedals, and the dashboard. Um, so what you're gonna be doing in R Studio, um, it'll kind of like, it'll help you auto-complete some code um, that's very useful when you need, um, as well as like if you're ever working yourself with like dashboards or something like that, uh, you can build those in here and they automate and the shiny package kind of will automatically provide like a templated code for you. Um, so there's a lot of like um, additional functionality as opposed to just coding in like a terminal or something like that, but it is possible. Okay. Um, and again, just the installation link. So I, I estimate it takes about five to 10 minutes here. Um, so we'll take like a brief pause um, before we move along here to see how the installation is going for everybody. Um, is anybody having any issues with the installation from CRAN or uh, the RStudio IDE? Um, are they unsure about like, some binaries that they should be installing? Uh, feel free to reach out here. I'll give it another few minutes for that. And just as an, a follow-up question to that, everybody was, was able to download the uh, GitHub repository uh, files for this course. Um, so no issues there, I'm assuming. So they say silence is golden, right? <laughs> okay. So I'll give it about one more minute here and then we'll get moving along. Um, all right. So SAS and R. Um, how do they compare and how are they different essentially? Um, kind of how the utility of SAS works is a lot of stuff will be manipulated through the data step. Um, so the data step will be used for in-file statements, uh, kind of formatting your data if you're not using like a prop format. Um, and then that leads into the next bullet point of like procedural analysis where it really emphasizes the proc statement, right? So um, that analysis can be done for like a proc univariate, a proc means, uh, uh, multiple functionality as far as like the procedure statements go, you can use it for reporting, um, but there's a limitation with that, right? So SAS is, is a commercialized software. Um, and what, what the recent trend is, has been is like more open source has been accepting um, acceptance um, or acceptable. Um, and um, that leads to more innovation, right? So people working together in a community allows for a quicker, um, I guess, to market solutions, right? So there's, I would say there's not as much of a stringent stringency on like the user acceptance testing, but there is um, a little bit more of like, like a communal acceptance, right? So you'll see more machine learning based algorithms essentially in R before you will in SAS, right? So SAS I believe is launched via, uh, so that's like a machine learning based solution. Um, however, uh, that's still relatively new, right? So they still may be working out their kinks as opposed to having an entire community working on a package where it may, it may have bugs, um, but it, it has been resolved since then. Um, and, and SAS will be kind of lagging behind in that sense. Um, so the reference to R um, leading into that is R stores data in what are known as objects. Um, so you might have heard of like object oriented programming. Essentially, we're going to store like all of our attributes within um, a given variable at a time. Um, and that variable can store like strings, it can store numeric values, it can store like a data frame, um, pretty much anything that you need to kind of reference um, can be stored in an object. Um, and that allows for very uh, user-friendly uh, functionality, um, especially when you're defining new functions in R. Um, and again, kind of just highlighting that point, right? Like R is open source. Um, so 
you, you can kind of work together a little bit more easily because um, all the tools that you need to interact with, say like somebody that you're um, trying to work on some code with, um, they're just open source, they're readily available for free. There's more, there's more people involved in just like this community structure as well. So I, I think there's a, a little bit more of a shift um, from SAS to R in that sense, um, as well as like statistically, kind of like what was brought up earlier with like some least squares estimate on um, some fit, right? Um, R will provide you that um, as opposed to like SAS not providing say like an estimate for something, say you try to overfit your variables in like a given model or something like that. Um, you just throw them all in there. Um, it, it may say nothing's really significant, right? Um, but R will still provide you like with an estimate of like what that, what that weight would be um, for like just like a linear trend or something like that. Um, SAS may say that it's like uncalculable. It'll just provide you with like some blank dashes. Um, so it allows the user to interpret what's given as opposed to the software to interpret what's given. Okay, so why R? Um, again, faster computation time, right? So you're going by a row by row state. Uh, so in, R, in SAS, uh, you're, you're given observations, right? And then those variables are determined by, by the fields, right? So, but um, you're going essentially horizontal when you're processing data um, as opposed to column by column, right? So say you store everything in like one variable, um, you can process that one variable faster than you can process a bunch of variables um, kind of horizontally down the line um, for a given observation as opposed to just defining that variable and going row by row of the variable. Um, so computationally, it's more efficient um, because again, the R stores the the values within memory and those values are uh, vertical uh, as far as like their calculation goes. Um, so an additional um, collaboration technique um, is R connect um, as well as get version control. And again, like mentioned earlier, the shiny dashboards, right? So when you're done with your analysis, um, do you need to process that through like a third party, um, say like BI or um, Tableau, some, some instance like that, right? So uh, the functionality to, to continue to progress with your code and and develop on that and allow more um, public viewership of like what, what analysis you've done, right? So you can just essentially provide an HTML link and say, here, go to this dashboard if you're interested in this analysis. Somebody doesn't have to necessarily open up any of your code. Um, and it allows for just like more managerial insight and, and collaboration amongst your, your analysts or your data scientists. Um, um, and then the third bullet point, advanced data science techniques. So, so some more well-known machine learning algorithms are available in R, but they're still not readily available in SAS, right? So neural nets is like a primary example of that before VIA kind of implemented um, some type of solution for like convoluted neural nets. Um, but there may be like more of like, like um, I guess some, some like user specific window functionality when like defining like a, uh, like a cross validation within a model, right? So SAS goes by like statistics. Um, for the most part, it kind of lives by that. And, it, and what the output is, um, you you kind of have to live with as a user, right? So there's no uh, finicky solution, I guess you can say, um, comparing like say like an inferential statistical model as opposed to like a machine learning model. Um, but if you ever wanted to implement some more advanced like data science uh, models, right? So uh, they may be available in Python, but then the next language might be R, right? It, it's not going to be SAS um, as time progresses. Um, so SAS is going to be kind of continuously playing catch up um, in this ever evolving data science world. Um, and then kind of like the fourth bullet, fourth bullet point, right? It's, it's cost effective just to kind of have um, an open source software, right? So just a single base license for SAS, um, this may be an old estimate, was about $8,700 for the first year. Um, and that kind of goes down um, with time. Um, However, it's still an additional cost and that's only for a single user license, right? So, so it does add up, right? And you could have some very powerful server set up for an open source system for that kind of cost um, for one user at least. <laughs> um, and then again, as well as like the increased talent pool. So I myself, um, a little bit about my background is like, I, I, I've gone through a few degrees here um, and I continuously see the evolution of more open source teachings as opposed to uh, the SaaS based teachings, right? So one example that uh, I recall of recent um, was kind of trying to get like residual estimates from like, uh, uh, just like a basic logistic fit. Um, and, and those estimates were kind of hard to replicate in SAS. I needed to kind of go through like three iterations of like uh, pulling those, those values out, right? So, so um, with like a uh, proc logistic or something like that, um, you have the option to output your, your standard deviation of your like residuals. Um, 
However, like with, with R, it, it's just kind of like addressing that column that's already given in the output. And you can kind of tailor the output to continuously always reproduce the same um, um, summary statistics, I guess you can say. So functionality wise, um, how does SAS work and how does R work, right? So the SAS goes through data steps and kind of how R works is like you're given expressions defining uh, your data and you can um, kind of manipulate those with functions. Again, SAS goes through procedures, same thing can be expressed within functions. It goes through some macros and you wanna kind of like um, um, set up some procedure that you're gonna be iterating through several times in the future. Um, again, expressed within a single function and that function can just be called within the script at like a heading file, right? Um, and then SAS functions, right? So there are like some, some basic SAS functions, right? So like if then uh, some, some do loopings there, um, those are, those are just basic R functions. Um, and then the output delivery system is kind of like a big one. Um, so output delivery system kind of is replicated through what's known as like R markdown. Um, so if you ever wanted like a summary table, right? You would kind of output that to a given given file, right? So I think the new cloud-based solutions for like a free tier are um, limited to only HTML. Um, now it used to be a Word, a PDF, or, or like a rich text format, and then um, a PDF file as well as HTML. So the freeware is, is seems like it's being limited a little bit further for students um, as opposed to like our mark now where it's like we're continuously evolving um, kind of how we output uh, text-based solutions, I guess, for, for more reporting senses. Okay. Let's check. Okay, great. So our packages, what is a package? Um, so as a package is in, in a, a brief sense, it's just a shareable, a shareable collection of code uh, that can be used to perform a specific function or, or any type of task, right? So um, say you have a bunch of like functions that you already have defined. Um, if you wanna just package all of those functions together, uh, you can make your own your own package of packages. <laughs> it's a never ending uh, cycle, I guess you can say. And who can make a package, right? Anybody can make a package. Um, packages are generally made publicly available via the CRAN network. So the CRAN stands for a comprehensive R architecture network. Um, and that's where you'll be downloading R from. So your binary files from there. Um, essentially, you can access most packages um, that are publicly available through the CRAN network. There are also uh, private packages, right? So there's an interactive functionality in R that allows you to kind of just download things um, from external repositories. Um, and you can make private packages if you want um, that can only be, I guess, shared between peers. Um, so packages can remain private if you wish. Um, but for the most part, again, we're a community-based uh, um, group of programmers, I would say. <laughs> okay. And then again, just like from a high level, uh, SAS procedures are expressed within our packages for the most part. And the functionality within the packages um, kind of help replicate um, what you're looking to do in, in um, R as opposed to SAS. Okay, um, so I'm just going to hit a, a quick pause here and just do a double check uh, for the local installation. Uh, this is kind of where we get into um, the, the IDE at least, so we'll go through a brief explanation here, um, but we'll give it a quick pause just to make sure that everybody's all set um, with their installations. No hiccups there, everybody's okay with the files. Oh yeah. So. Okay, great. And then again, just when you're on the GitHub, um, you can just click the code, you can download it as zip and kind of store that locally where you would remember where you put it. <laughs> um, essentially, you'll load all the files through um, this little viewer pane here. Okay. Just keep this over here. All right. Okay, so uh, basic navigation of, of, of the R Studio IDE, right? So if you have R installed, you should you should be able to install um, R Studio. Um, and don't mind like the yummy pasta recipe. Uh, that's just some paste code that I pulled. Uh, so essentially, the script will uh, be loaded here, right? Um, you can see we have R Kitchen analogy here, um, and this is where we create scripts um, 
you have the option to manipulate kind of all these panes how you would like. Um, however, the default uh, layout looks like a little something like this. Um, and this is where scripts are loaded. So defining it on like just like a, a post recipe sense, uh, scripts are recipes um, and they record how we do things, right? So when you're looking to write anything, uh, when you're looking to kind of like save your, save your work um, for reusable access later, um, that'll be in your R script here. Um, you also have the option um, on the below pane here uh, in the console. Um, so the console is like where kind of like the cooking of the code happens, right? So you can execute code within this, this console here um, without actually writing anything within uh, the scripting window up here. Um, and that's just like for some basic, um, basic scripts that you would write. So I find myself writing just like a lot of summary statements within the lower uh, left-hand portion here. Um, just to kind of view some of my data sets and see how the output was generated before I finalize it within the script up here. Um, and just like for an analogy there, um, you can cook here without using a recipe, but you'll struggle to remember exactly how, you, how to cre create a dish um, in the future. So it's better to use a recipe, right? So if you're ever gonna need that code again, uh, it's just a best practice to put that within the script that you're about to save. Um, just as like a general sense, um, a general rule there. So. Going up to the lower right or upper right quadrant, uh, so like quadrant run on like a Cartesian plane, um, this is the environment. So in the environment, this is where it will store kind of like your local variables that you define within your script. Um, it'll store any data sets, any vectors that you have, um, pretty much anything that you're gonna be using within your code um, that's already imported and read into the environment uh, will be placed here. So you'll be able to see like kind of like a numeric type, um, kind of like what that variable is made of, um, and just like a basic summary of like what's going on in your code. Um, so that's, it's pretty useful. Um, and kind of like when you're done with your uh, code, a good practice is to um, kind of clean your environment. So if you don't plan to use any of those variables, you have overlapping variable names within another script. Um, you kind of just click this little broom here and it'll kind of clear everything for you. Um, and just the analogy there is you can put ingredients, um, which is in this sense data, um, and finish your dish, essentially your model output um, here um, to use while you continuously cook, right? So say you have like some output of a model there um, and you can't remember like the reference of it because you're down the line like 104, right? So you can like see the name over here to reference for later use if you're looking to compare like divergences on like a given model or something like that relative to like your predictive values. Um, an example. Um, and then the viewer pane um, in, in the bottom right hand most corner, um, this essentially is where you'll see your files. And you can see we have a few tabs here. So we have files, we have plots, we have packages, we have help, we have viewer. Um, we'll go through a little bit of an example um, in a second there, um, but just in a given sense, um, your viewer is kind of like where you see all of your file structure, right? Um, it, any type of file that you're, you're looking to interact with, um, this, is, this is kind of where your set given directory will show uh, what's within that file pathway. Um, and then kind of just like a, a brief overview is like a packages or like tools for the sauce pan. Uh, if you're looking to reference like a package in the future, um, you go out and you buy one that is already, that someone has already like made. Um, and essentially that's kind of referenced through the install packages. So um, a neat thing is if you're looking to do anything in R, somebody's probably already like done what you're looking to do. Um, so redefining packages, um, it, it's not the best use of time. Uh, as long as that package is kind of reliable and well-maintained within the community, um, it should be fun to use. Um, there's no real harm in it. It's been it's been a few years for some of these. <laughs> um, so yeah, and just as a little little bit of a side note there, every time you want to kind of like use a package, uh, the reference is, is the library command up here. Um, but we'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. Um, so I want to pause here. I just want to go through and make sure that everybody is able to open up their instance of R. Um, I think this will kind of give me a whole new. Okay, great. So this is kind of what uh, the default layout would look like. Um, I have just like a base um, setup here um, and you can see uh, we're missing one of the windows here, right? So if we wanted to create a new file, uh, we would go to file and then we would go to new file and you can see the shortcut there and all the options that you have to um, kind of interact, right? So we have a markdown file here, HTML, CSS, so forth. Um, but for this sense, we're just going to click our script. Um, and if you guys want to follow along, that's, that's great. <laughs> uh, feel free to, but this is just going to be a little bit of an example. Um, 
So if I wanted to kind of just like install like a basic package here, I would like reference that up here. And then like, I can just like type in the package, um, like dplyr would be an example if I spelled it right. Um, and then you can see, oh, oh. Uh, sorry. Okay, probably just the spelling error. Okay. Then you can see like I use the tab there for like the autocomplete, which is very useful. So, I mean, this is how you would install a base package. I mean, I'm not, I can install that, I guess. Um, and then to reference that package, it would just look something like this. Uh, so those are just like how you reference things. Um, and then in the terminal window here, you just have like kind of like a general console or that you can write R scripts in. Um, some jobs that you have kind of like scheduled out. Um, and this is kind of like the file structure in the lower right hand corner where my mouse is. Um, so you have files, you have plots, you have packages, you have help, you have viewer. Um, if you ever need help with like a given package, this is super useful. Um, there are shortcuts available such as like, I mean, if you're in here, you can do like a double and you can just do like a dplyr and it'll like bring up the help menu for dplyr. Um, and you can see like that pulled it up within this help window. Um, so there are shortcuts to kind of like find help um, within R. Um, and if we're looking for just like the introduction to the package itself. It'll give you an introduction and you can see like there's a Star Wars example and we're kind of going to be going through the Star Wars example here. Uh, so forgive me for uh, keeping that with this course. I, I like Star Wars. <laughs> um, okay, so for a brief introduction for the course, um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just make sure that we have everything set up. So I'm just gonna clear this out. Um, the shortcut to clear out a console um, is control and L. Um, that's how I clear out the console. I think it's a very quick and efficient way to do so. Uh, be careful of what you're doing. Also, um, if you're looking for shortcuts in the console, um, you can hit the up arrow and it'll kind of go through what was installed earlier. And you can see I missed an S in install packages. <laughs> um, so just a few tips there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna navigate to kind of where we stored that data, right? So uh, mine's in my desktop um, and you can see like, we want to kind of know the pathway where we're going. Um, so for this portion, um, I want to go to my desktop, which is already defined within my home reference. So you can see I'm, I'm in the home, I'm on my OneDrive and I am in my desktop. Um, and you can see here's, here's the list of files that we have for this course. All right, so what we're gonna do now, um, once we've navigated to where we put those files, right? So if you're looking to kind of like, the home is kind of like the default home for a given computer at any time. Um, so like if I wanted to, I would just kind of go where my, where my files are, go on my OneDrive, go back to my desktop, and then go within the folder that you stored the data. Um, so once we're in this folder, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set that as our working directory. So we're gonna click this more button and then we're gonna to go to set as working directory. And you can see that within the console, what it printed out is our working directory that we have. And uh, this little tilde here uh, just kind of is like a shortcut for um, the prefix for what's defined as home, right? So my home in this sense would just be my home. Um, and then we kind of work down through the layers of the root. Um, not super important. Um, what's important is establishing your working directory within these folders. Um, if you ever wanna like, see what your working directory is. You, and you can see like, before I even completed this code, uh, it kind of returns the functionality or the function that we need. And pretty much we'll just reference that and it'll print out or the working directory that we have. Um, useful tools for later, if you need to reference them. Okay. Try and keep this up over here. All right, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Um, if anybody has any problems, just uh, feel free to kind of go to the chat. Um, I wouldn't say I'm very familiar with, with Zoom, so I try and keep this chat open as best I can for you. All right, so just getting started, um, at a basic level, um, R is a calculator, right? So um, we can see like it does perform addition, uh, pretty basic if we just wanted to put that in, um, exponential operands, uh, multiplication, division, um, the modulus operand, so, essentially like the remainder there, right? Um, and then the order of operations, it'll kind of just follow that, right? Um, 
so those are all like the desired outputs um, that we would expect. Um, So assigning variables. Assigning variables in R um, essentially it uses that little arrow symbol. Um, so you're going to be pointing at what you want to assign. Uh, that's kind of how I remember it. Um, and again, these are all known as kind of as objects, right? So X is now an object, Y is now an object, Z is now an object, right? But what we store in that object kind of defines what, what each structure is. Um, so in this sense, um, if we want to just make a few assignments um, and store, store some calculations within a given variable, um, call this X in this sense. Um, and we wanted to store like 32 times four. We can just store that value. And we wanted to store like Y and give it the value of three. Um, so those are both integers in that sense. And say we wanted to create like a third variable that's derived from a calculation from the two previous variables and we'll call that Z. Um, and you can see we just have X over Y. Um, we assign that to Z. If we just output Z, which is uh, just putting the letter Z and executing that line, um, it'll give you a printout, right? So this is the output from, from what you'll see in R. Um, and it just does the basic calculations that you would expect from a given calculator. Um, and it's pretty intuitive assigning things. Um, it's not super challenging, but um, if you need to assign anything, essentially you're gonna be needing to reference that little arrow. Um, and it's always the arrow pointing at something. That's a good way to remember it. Okay. So some more complicated data structures um, are known as vectors, right? So you can think of a vector as like a collection of, of items, right? So um, it can be a bunch of strings, some numerical uh, values. So this can be like integers or real numbers. Um, and you kind of use this command known as C and then whatever's within the C uh, parentheses there, um, that's used to concatenate arguments together. So if we look at this pop um, variable here, um, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking this function C and we're combining uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and um, 10,000, all in one uh, reference variable called pop. Um, so it'll it'll concatenate all those arguments and it'll store them accordingly. And again, how do we work in R? We work in columns as opposed to rows. <laughs> uh, so all those will be observations in that sense. Um, and then again, same thing, same thing below. Um, so we have area square mile um, and we're kind of just taking that, those arguments um, of 83.78, uh, 46.87 and 503. And you can see the different, different decimal precision there. It doesn't necessarily impact any way of storing the variable. Um, so it'll store it as is based on the assignment um, for user-defined variables. Um, so, and then a third example here, uh, we just have city. Um, so city, this is an example of like concatenating string arguments together. So for this, for this sake, we have Seattle, San Francisco and LA. And all we're doing is we're taking that um, these, th these three values, concatenating them into a single um, object known as city, um, and we're storing them, right, for later use. And so we want to just see the output of those, right? So um, you can see like pop, right? Uh, it defines everything as a single given integer in that sense, because that's the way we define those values. Um, area square mile, right? We, we noticed that 503 has outputted um, similar to the two previous values. That's because it's gonna take in the argument as, as 503, but it'll output the argument in a printable fashion that's similar uh, to the first argument, right? So in this sense, 83.78, um, it'll output it to two decimal precision uh, to follow that as well. Um, and then just, just our output from uh, city, you can notice we have a little bit of spacing here um, that just, that's based on the, uh, the size of the string uh, that's passed through, right? So we have different sizes here going on. So it's gonna kind of like maximize the spacing to kind of fit those all evenly on the given printout. So whatever has like the max distance, it's gonna use that and it's gonna say, okay, well, um, these all need to have X amount of bytes together um, in order to kind of match length, right? So sometimes spacing occurs and that can be, um, that can be fixed if you're looking to do some reporting. Um, and that's just using like a basic like justify command or something like that. Um, and just as a heads up, if you need any references on like um, any of these packages that are referenced in this course, um, they're all local on CRAN. Um, they're made public and available. Um, we don't have a lot of time to cover um, uh, some of the examples, but a lot of the packages that are provided within this course are very useful for re replicating what you do in uh, SAS. And there are some, um, some further examples of like modeling. So there's like a model sum function that you may see uh, that would be useful um, as well for future use. So uh, 
I encourage you to continue to explore um, some of the packages provided here. Okay. Let me just get a quick sip. So some more complicated data structures. Um, this is where we're gonna get into kind of like data framing. Um, so there are two types of, of main data structures that you'll see um, for numeric values. They're, they're data, for, well, just, just for values. Uh, so they're data frames and they're tibbles. Um, so a data frame um, is essentially a collection of vectors. Um, and these all have the same length. And the, this is the use, most useful structure um, for like any type of data analysis. So most of the time when you're seeing some R segments, those will probably be replicated. Those will probably be represented um, via a data frame. Uh, the output of a tibble is a little bit more, uh, I guess, structured, um, just because it does emphasize what's known as like tidy analysis and tidy storage structure. Um, so what a tibble is, it's like a specialized version of a data frame, um, just designed with that tidy analysis in mind. So um, equal observations for a given row, equal amount of variables for a given um, uh, data set, right? So if you have like one value within a given data set, that's not necessarily a tidy value for a variable, right? And you can have like long printouts, um, you can have shorter printouts. Um, essentially, it'll, it'll, form, it'll be a formatted data set of um, equal length and equal width for like a given observation and a variable subset. Um, okay, so the two main differences uh, between these um, a data frame and a tibble are kind of like printing and subsetting, right? So tibbles uh, have this refined print method um, that shows only the first 10 rows and, and basically every column that would fit on the screen uh, shows up. So they're gonna be like carryovers where you see like not all the variables would fit on a given line um, within a given print window. So some of, some of those variables will get carried down um, and you'll see like a truncated, truncated data set um, that'll that'll print out those main observations, the first 10 rows. And then uh, the remaining variables will say like 10 variables not shown or something like that. And it'll kind of like give you the list of the variables that don't show. Um, so in that sense, like tidy data is very nice to have. It's kind of like a standard, um, but for the most part, I find myself working a lot more with data frames because I generally like to see that output um, just as like a use case scenario. scenario. Um, and just again, tibbles are very strict about how you subset. Um, so if you're trying to access a variable that doesn't exist, you're just going to get an error. Um, as opposed to like um, like a data frame, it'll 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 just put out nothing. It'll say no. <laughs> um, so those are kind of like the two main differences between those two, um, um, I guess, data structures. Um, and you'll find yourself um, working more with uh, data frames as opposed to tibbles. But for like reporting instances, tibbles are kind of ideal. Um, just because of how neat they are. Okay. So this is just a basic example of like a data frame. Um, so you can see in this, this example, we have city info uh, dot D, um, D for data frame. <laughs> uh, and you can see like how we name variables here is a little bit different too, right? So like putting in a period and then D is like, I wouldn't say it's a common practice, but it, it, it's a preferred practice in some instances. Um, I find myself when I'm programming, I define my functions as like .f and then my data frames or my tibbles is like .d and .t, just so users kind of have an idea of what they expect to see. Um, I've seen that before and I kind of just picked up that practice. Um, it's not a recommendation one way or the other, but just a thought when you're uh, naming your variables. Um, and you can see here, so we have city info .d. Um, and what we're pointing at, right? We're again, we're pointing at this variable name. Um, we're using the data dot frame function um, to concatenate uh, pop uh, area square mile in city. Um, and then we're just going to print that out, right? So this this final command here will print that out. So you can see we have like the first few observations here. We have pop. Uh, well, we have all the observations. It's a small set. We have pop area square mile, and then we have city. Um, and you can see, again, as well, the area square mile, uh, how did it print out? 503.00. Uh, um, so this is just a basic example of how you make a data frame and um, what the output is kind of what the output will look like for a data frame. Uh, contrary to the data frame, we have a tibble. Um, so the assignment statement is very similar, right? Um, and you can see I, I did leave off the T here as a practice. <laughs> Uh, but we were going to name this variable city info, and um, we're going to assign that using the tibble command, and we're pointing at the variable that we want. 
Um, and we're going to take those vectors that we created earlier, uh, pop, uh, area square mile, and city. Um, and then we're going to output that, right? And you can see uh, there's a little bit of a difference here uh, that we notice, right? So the first thing is, right, we define like the structure of the data frame, right? Three by three. Um, we define like the type of the data, right? So we have double here, double here, and then we have a character here. Um, and then what do we see um, for this output, right? We have sig figs, right? So in this sense, we have three and three here. So how your data is outputted um, does matter in a sense, but for the most part, the scientific community seems to prefer uh, tables and the, uh, uh, I would say more so like the data science, like non-GMP, non GXP uh, environment kind of prefers working with data frames. Um, so just two quick differences that you'll see there. Um, just how they print out, right? Okay, so now we're gonna get our hands a little bit dirty. Um, let me just see, I think I have example one here. Okay. All right, so we're gonna do now, um, we're gonna go to our studio um, IDE here, um, and we're gonna open up uh, exercise one. All right, so um, we'll walk through this example. Um, for the given later examples within the course, um, I provided kind of some reference code above um, that you can kind of look into. So uh, completing those, I'll give you a little bit more time, about five minutes, we'll say, um, just to kind of look over some code, the very basic examples to um, kind of utilize some of the packages. Um, but for these, we'll just walk through them pretty quickly, um, just so you get an idea and get your hands a little bit dirty with the keyboard. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to want to do here is we want to create two variables uh, called X and Y, right? So we'll just like name those right now. Um, the shortcut on a keyboard to make this little arrow, um, at least for me, you ha I have control, uh, the Windows button, and then I have Command Alt. So I could click the Command Alt and the um, uh, kind of like the hyphen uh, symbol next to the plus minus button um, on the top of the keyboard. One, two, left of backspace. Um, can replicate that. So if you just click command and then the hyphen, it'll produce that. But if not, you, you can kind of type that out if you want. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable uh, called x, and what we're going to we're going to store in there is, is just the values four by three. Um, to execute a line, um, there are two options. Um, we can highlight the line and we can kind of hit the run button, right? So you can see like we have one variable now. Um, the other option is to kind of just like go next to the line and hit control um, enter. Um, and then you can see like it only executed a single line. So we hit the control enter button and you can again, see the replication there. Um, so those are how you assign it. And you can see like all the output is here as well as like going back to our reference variables, right? What is this value? Um, what is this variable? And what is this value stored in? So we have X here um, that we just assigned to and it's given the value of 12, which is the correct output for four times three. Um, so we're going to go through that second example here. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Um, and then we're going to do three divided by one for this example. And then again, uh, control enter. Um, so it looks like we have those two values assigned correctly. Um, we're going to create a third variable here called Z. And we're going to assign that the value of X times Y. Um, and then we're just going to hit enter. Oh. All right, sorry, I keep going back and forth with the command buttons. Um, and you can see like now we have our variable X, Y, and Z, um, Z or Z. Um, and the values are 12, which we expect from that, uh, three, which we expect from Y, and then 36, which we expect from the multiplication of uh, X times Y or Z. And then if we just wanna print the output of that, we just, we can just print Z um, and it'll give us our output within our, our window here. All right. So if you wanna save it, um, now that we've worked on it or at least created the most basic variables that we could. Um, and you can see like, I'm the exit of this currently, second. Um, you can see that it's red here. Um, if we just wanna click file and then we can go to save and then you can see this turns back to black once, once no more changes have been committed. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create our first vector. Um, and our first vector is gonna be called my first vector. So we're gonna go through here and we're gonna assign it the values of four, three, two, 
than one. Um, how we do that, again, is if we want to store multiple arguments, right? We use the C function here. So we're going to assign that four, three, two, and one. And then we're going to hit control and enter. And you can see we have our my first vector here. Um, it's of numerical data type. It gives you the references for your values. So we have value one here, value two, value three, and value four. Um, some languages will reference the first index of an array as zero. Uh, some will reference it as one. Uh, you can see here we have it as reference. Um, so that's important for later use. And now we're going to create a, we're going to continue on with this and we're going to create uh, my second vector. Um, so we're going to walk through here. And then we're just going to reference it as five, six, seven, and eight. And then we're going to hit control and then enter. And you can see we have my second vector now. Okay, so now uh, we're looking to create our first data frame. So recall that we used the function data dot frame, um, and then open parentheses there to kind of define those structures. Um, so we're going to call this value my first data frame, and we're going to use the data frame function. I'm going to have open parentheses here. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to pass in my first vector and you can see exactly what R just did. Um, so we have my first data frame um, and then we have my first vector. Um, for now, this has no assignment. It's in orange. Um, the pink value means it's given a value and it has a current assignment. Um, so we're just going to select that, right? And we're going to keep going and we're going to let it complete. Um, and essentially, So what we're going to want to do here is pass in both values. Okay, great. And you can see we have our, our columns that are essentially defined. So uh, to pass in multiple arguments, remember that we need uh, our C command to concatenate the arguments. Um, and then we're going to print out this value of my first uh, data frame here. And you can see again, the printout does match. So we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, we're going to define a tipple. Uh, and we're going to call this my first tip. And we're going to keep going with our tipple function. Oh, right, right, right. Um, so something that needs to get done. Sorry about this, I forgot. Um, so what we need to do is we need to open up the packets installation um, and we're just gonna highlight all of these values um, and we're gonna hit control and enter and then it's gonna need to install some of these for a second. Um, so those might take a little bit to run. Um, it's 4.22 already, oh man. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Oh man, we have a little bit of a while. Okay. Um, sorry, I attend this course to run about two hours. Um, these should only take about a few minutes to install. Um, but the second you have all of these installed, those will be the references for the class. And then going forward, we're going to need to uh, kind of utilize like the library function to reference those. Um, and you can see like, the reason I, I forgot about that at this point is because we need the uh, tidyverse package, right? Tidy data, tidyverse, tibble, tidy data. Right. Uh, just a basic way to remember that. Um, and, and like pretty much all these should be done um, if you installed those at this point. Um, so within exercise one, um, pretty much at the heading column, like at the header of the file, what you're gonna need to do is you're just gonna need to reference uh, like the tidyverse. Uh, oh, tidy, tidy, yeah. And then what that's gonna do is it's gonna pull it in. It's gonna show a little bit of a reference there. Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna go back down uh, and, and continue on with our function here. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of define these, right, my first tibble, uh, oh, my first vector, and then we wanna concatenate that with my second vector. And then boom, all right. And now all we're gonna do is we're gonna print out our final value. Um, so this is gonna be my first tibble. 
and then we're going to output that. And you can see like we have our double value and we have our observations here. Uh, Tibble is going to be eight by one. So essentially like how that'll work is it'll concatenate the values into a single observation. So these are like on like. Um, so we have our first data frame here um, and then we have our second data frame here um, or our second vector here. Um, so it recognizes the similar values and it'll pass those through as a single given row or a single given column, right? Um, and if we just want to save that, we'll close this out and hop back over here to the PowerPoint a little bit. Okay. All right. So this brings us into reading in some data. Um, reading in data from SAS um, can be a little bit uh, tedious. There's a few ways to read in data from SAS. Um, essentially, you can use like there's a newer option for like versions beyond like 9.4 of SAS. Essentially, you can kind of utilize like your uh, libref function to um, incorporate like an XLS engine. Um, this point is one advanced way to do it. Uh, the common ways to do it uh, is, is the proc import, um, which you can see here. This is just a basic example of the code that I've written to uh, generate this COVID data set. Um, so you can use the set, you can use the proc import statement, or you can just kind of import your data uh, utilizing the uh, data step, um, your in file statement, and then adding in some input variables and specifying either the length or width of the columns that you desire. Um, so yeah, this is the basic example of like how SAS code would look just to use the proc import data function, right? And this will utilize the database management system of CSV um, and it'll output the COVID data file as a SAS 7 data file, right? Um, In R, it's a little bit different, right? So um, you can read in data from a local file. You can read in data from a URL. Um, you can load in data that's already predefined from a built-in R package, um, which is very useful. And some of the examples today that we're going to be going through are will include um, some of the data from built-in packages. So it's useful if you need to quickly access data, um, as well as the medical data repository that I pulled this COVID data from. Has a lot of utilized or a lot of um, freely available data, and you can see like when you connect GitHub as well, you can um, um, kind of pull in a lot of that data that you wouldn't else otherwise be able to see. I guess, um, which is which is weird to say, but it's useful if you're exploring for data that you need. It's it's difficult to find some some um, test data sets sometimes. All right. So for a given example, um, say we have a data set called my data set, right? Um, and we have a few options to kind of like look at this data directly. Um, we have the my data statement and I'll simply like print out the data um, into the console. Um, and again, for like tibbles, the output will be like limited to rows and columns that fit on a given screen, right? So kind of like that print is where the difference is. Um, view my data. So essentially view data, uh, what it'll do is it'll pull up in a, a separate tab um, within your R console, your R ID. Um, and that'll bring you like a, an Excel based like spreadsheet format, right? Um, so it'll, it'll just open up a new window. Um, the most common um, example that I find myself using is the head functions, right? So you can see two examples there. We have head my data, which is the example data set here. that will look at the first six rows of data. So uh, that includes like the header. So essentially it'll print out the first five rows including the header. Um, and then the head my data um, and specifying your observation rows. So similar like how you would use um, like a like a first obs first obs function um and like obs like those interchangeably in sas um you can define like the subset of data that you want you wish to look at um pretty similar with like the head and tail functions um quickly i guess and you can segment out data as well not with the head function but similar um so this brings us to like principles of like tidy data so the principles of like tidy data is essentially like every variable forms a column, each observation forms a row. Um, those are pretty basic standards. Um, and then each type of observational unit forms a single given table. Um, so the, those are the principles of tidy data, um, kind of why tidy data. Um, we're looking for a little bit more of like consistency, right? So code writing, um, code written with like one tidy data set and analysis can be easily applied to another, right? There's no more uh, fiddling around with the functionality um, between data sets. Um, and most of the functions that uh, work with vectors, so like storing variables as vectors and columns, that kind of just like makes sense um, for tidy data uses. Um, so the tidy data, uh, the tidyverse packages include like dplyr, uh, gdplot2, et cetera. 
Um, and those are all designed to kind of like work with tidy data, right? So we saw tidy R as part of the tidy burst package right there. Um, yeah. So uh, continuing on with like some tidy burst packages. Um, so like a collection of packages uh, designed to work uh, with tidy data. Um, some of them include like the plier. Uh, so we'll see that a little bit for like data wrangling. Um, ggplot2 for data visualization and stringer. Uh, so that's essentially for like substringing data a lot, uh, manipulating uh, more string based data sets. Um, and then like just like basic installation that we kind of covered already is like the installation install packages, uh, tidyverse, and that only needs to get done once uh, once you have like that those binaries installed within your uh, your environment, uh, you can kind of like reference those using the reference below like library and then tidyverse. Uh, but that has to be referenced every single code, the library uh, tidyverse part. Okay, um, let me just get a quick sip of water. Sorry, there's, there's no AC in my book. So the Haven package. The Haven package is actually part of the tidyverse package. So um, again, there's packages within packages within packages. Uh, it's pretty useful. Um, what this will do is it'll essentially read in your SAS files. Um, your SPSS files are like stata files, um, uh, essentially with like different methods, different functions um, within R. Um, so there's like a collection of functions there and we'll read in different data types for you. Uh, kind of the downfall is like the outputs are tibbles. Um, those are easily manipulated for data frames if you desire. Again, I prefer to work a little bit more with data frames as opposed to tibbles, um, but that's like more of a preference for like how your data is structured versus unstructured, right? Um, so the two basic commands uh, that come with the Haven package are read SAS, um, um, and that'll support like uh, your basic SAS uh, 7 BDAT files. Um, so kind of like those data sets that you uh, import using the PRAC import statement, right? Um, and it'll accompany uh, kind of like the uses of the record of those like value labels. Um, <clears throat> so kind of like the use cases of each variable, I guess you can say, right? <clears throat> And then the uh, write SAS functionality is, is something that's pretty useful, right? So it, the only downfall is it's a little bit experimental. Uh, so kind of like the overlap for SAS and R is, um, I don't want to say like new, but um, we're, it's, it's still in like a development process, right? Like the inter, interoperability between uh, programming languages, right? So I think that that period is kind of just beginning a little bit. Um, but yeah, the write, write underscore SAS um, and then the two the two uh, parentheses there are essentially um, write your SAS data set or your, your uh, data set out to a SAS file if you wish to move back to SAS. So just like a basic example of this, um, and this will kind of like incorporate, uh, be incorporated from like um, uh, the COVID data set that we'll be utilizing. So um, you can see like I have my object here of COVID.SAS. Um, again, good practice to kind of label things like that. Um, and then we have our arrow pointing at um, what we want to store. Um, then we have read and then underscore SAS. Um, and then we'll just like import this uh, covid.sas7bdat file in uh, to our um, covid.sas object. And then we can just print out that object. Um, so we'll just do the head function from earlier, um, reference that object. And you can see like we have our tibble here. Um, and this is kind of like the example of like truncating the printout of the statement, right? So as you're working with a little bit more of like real data sets, um, and this is just an example of data set that was like um, obviously anonymized for, for the use cases here. So none of these are real people. <laughs> um, but we have our data types again, and we have we see our table, right? It's six by 17. Um, and then you can see this is kind of like what I was talking about earlier. We have dot 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 with 10 more variables, right? So that continuation down below the printout. Um, and we can see like results of character, demos, character, age is a double, and so forth and so. Um, okay. All right. So now we're going to go through a little bit of a programming, programming example. Um, I think this one's example two. Yep. OK, great. So what we want to do here is we want to have a reference. Forgive me for not having a reference. Um, and we're going to just reference our library that we need. Uh, Uh, we can clear the output here um, just so we have what we have. All right. So what we want to do here is we want to reference the COVID data set. So essentially what you saw on the slide, um, that's what we're going to be looking to do, but we're going to be looking to read in this data set essentially from the beginning. So we're going to call this data set COVID. Um, we're just going to use the read.csv. Uh, um, and then we're going to give our file name, um, which is already defined within our directory. So 
we don't need to include um, kind of like this entire path um, that we saw above, right? So if we, if we, again, print, if we do like our Git working directory, oh, hold on. If we get our you know, entire directory, right? Like I don't need to include all this anymore. Um, what I need to include is like what, what the file name is um, considering we're already working here, um, as you can see from the Git working directory command. Um, so in this window, um, you can see there's the covid.csv file. Um, and in this sense, it's just going to be called covid.csv. And then the only option that we want to add in here is um, uh, the header option. So the header option essentially says, is there a header row um, for this data set, right? So there are other options like se separation where we can like define like, like is it delimited by this? Um, but the data reads in pretty neatly, so there's no real sense um, in doing that for this uh, of course. So this is the command that we need to do. Um, and this will assign our, our data set uh, to COVID. Um, so we're just gonna execute that. Um, and you can see like we have our observations here. Again, um, you can see like all the variables we have from the previous analysis, but COVID is now imported with 15,524 observations with 17 variables. And we're just gonna print out a few variables. We're gonna print out a few um, values from this. So we're gonna use the head function. Um, and you can see like, here's what it looks like. Um, and you can see like how this data is structured, right? So how does the printout tell you how it's structured? Um, a data frame, right? Because we see <clears throat> how this printout occur. Um, there's no data types of like the variables underneath each each uh, label, right? Um, oh, I guess I did add in a reference. All right, so we can just add in the reference there for the Haven um, as we have. And now, um, again, given we're in our directory that we wish to operate in, <clears throat> Um, we're just going to use the write command. Um, so we're going to write this SAS file out. And then, um, I don't know, we can just call it like COVID dot or COVID underscore example dot SAS 7B dot. All right. Oh, path. Okay, my bad. So we're gonna need our pathway first. Um, so like just starting over here, um, I'm gonna name this like COVID example. Um, that's uh, and then we're just gonna pass in the COVID data set. Right. Um, Hmm. One second. Oh, <laughs> uh, I had it, had it in reverse. Uh, uh, and then we're just gonna type in this. And then boom, <laughs> after three attempts. All right, so now we have to look at the bottom. Um, so I have this sorted by like size. Uh, we can sort it by date. Um, and then we see uh, we have COVID underscore SAS dot SAS 7B dot. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're just going to read in this data set. Um, so we're going to read in our SAS file. Um, and then we're going to assign that to COVID and then underscore SAS. And then, so we just want to reference what we have here. All right, now we're just going to print out the first few observations of our COVID SAS data set. And cool. Now you can see the, the printout differences here, right? So again, uh, the read SAS function uh, will import this as a tibble. Um, and recall that we are working with it up here um, as a data frame, right? So the different functionality there is defined um, within like what's what the utility of the function is itself in the package, right? So more institutions are gonna be using SAS for, all right. Um, so yeah, the, the difference is like how the data gets stored, right? So more people are gonna be using SAS for, um, 
uh, like uh, medical reporting, healthcare um, analytics, things like that. Um, but mainly it's used for statistical analysis, right? But um, kind of your use case for your data set matters a lot for how you store your data and structure your data. Um, but for the most part, I would say more people are familiar with like SAS being very nitpicky about how the data um, is structured and stored and um, manipulated, I would say. I think our biggest um, pain point from SAS is kind of like formatting, um, at least for me. I don't think anybody doesn't have a date nine story <laughs> to talk about. All right. So um, just like a quick note um, from Darren, uh, he's from the TA sphere. Uh, he, he said in our studio, the broom icon also clears the stuff in the console um, to clear it. And the environment window also deletes the objects. So if we wanna just kind of play around with that, we can see it includes hidden objects here and then um, we're kind of out of that. So that was a good point by Darren, thank you. All right. So, uh, this one's still 6.30, so yeah, we're, we're doing all right. So I think we'll take about a five minute break right now. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, we'll kind of reconvene at 4.45. Um, yeah, we'll just... Uh, Close the share there and let's pause. All right, so I hope everybody can see my screen again. Um, hope you had a good quick break here. Um, we're all set. Um, hope everybody's ready to dive into some deep higher and some pipes. Um, all right, let me just make sure. Okay, cool. All right. So from here, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about data wrangling. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, manipulating data uh, with dplyr. Um, so data kind of is like rarely ready um, to analyze, right? So wrangling data um, into the proper shape is critical for the task, right? So Again, like the use case scenario of like tibbles, right? Carry over functionality of like similar data sets, but sometimes your data is not often very clean. Um, so you're gonna need to kind of clean that up yourself um, for a lot of analysis. So some, some useful functions that we have are kind of like filter, um, select, arrange, uh, mutate, uh, transmute, um, spread, um, and gather. Um, so uh, pretty much like the most common two that are used are filter um, and select. Um, arrange and mutate are used pretty frequently. Um, and kind of the bottom bottom three are like more so like formatting things um, or the bottom two at least. Um, yeah, so um, hopping into a little bit of like uh, a data set here, um, we'll talk a little bit about the pipe syntax. Um, so recall earlier, um, we were assigning an object um, um, with, with this arrow indicator, right? So in this case, in this case like a TV summary, um, and like for this example, right? Say, say we want to restrict um, like a World Health Organization tuberculosis data set. Um, to just countries that we're interested in, right? So in this case, like China and Afghanistan. Um, and then we're looking to kind of like compute the incidence of like tuberculosis cases, right? So like annual cases per say 100,000 people. Um, and finally, like sort those results by decreasing um, incidence. So the code below um, is an example of like how to do that, right? But um, it, it's, it's very hard to read uh, kind of like what's going on, right? So um, that's more of like an in and out functionality of like what you're looking at, but like you kind of reference like incidents as like the negative, the descending sort. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a little confusing, um, but essentially like um, it's not very clean code is the gist of it. Uh, a better way to kind of like approach this code um, is using the pipe syntax. Um, so like you'll see um, in the previous case, right? Like we call all these functions within each function. Um, here we're kind of just re referencing um, let's do something and then and then let, let's do something else, right? So um, the best way to think about the pipe syntax in any use case is always to say to yourself, and then uh, is like what you're looking to perform. So um, the pipe syntax, um, which is like the percent um, and then a little carrot of like pointing to what you're doing um, um, and then a closing parenthesis or percentage sign, um, it's useful uh, for kind of like chaining events or chaining commands together. Um, and you can see like this event is, is a lot more intuitive. 
Um, the output, um, because we reference this table, um, it, it will output the table as, as performed within the code below. So previously, we actually had to call that output um, within the object, right? So um, here, we're just kind of like referencing that object and then um, outputting what we desire. In this case, we're going to start with the who data set. Um, with table one on that first line, we're going to point to what we're looking at um, uh, or what we're looking to perform next, so and then. Um, so in this case, we're looking to filter the data set. We're looking at country, and we're saying um, a similar command for like like most part of the naming language is just in. So when a value is within the data set, we're looking for those references. So the references here are going to be Afghanistan and China. Um, and then, right, so at the end of that line, um, we have another pipe syntax. We're going to mutate the data set. So we're going to essentially uh, define um, what incidence is as a variable. Um, and that, that was 100,000 cases um, or 100,000 times the cases and that those values are gonna be over the population. So here we're defining a, a variable, we're filtering for a data set already for Afghanistan and China. And then we're gonna be arranging that data set um, in descending order based on the instance value that we just calculated. Um, so this is a lot neater to read. Um, and you can see like, there's no real confusion about what's going on here. Uh, and this is kind of how like the sequential order of code would be working for most programming languages as well. Um, so I, I do a little, a little bit of PySpark and like this, this is how I sequence or sequ um, um, sequence my programming. Um, you understand what you're doing, um, define any new additional variables that you need and kind of like uh, output that as desired, right? These are the basic uh, programming schemas. Okay, um, so hopping a little bit to a different subject, we're going to talk about formatting a little bit. Um, so a common uh, procedural format in SAS is known as like the proc format, right? So you can, there's there's multiple ways to do things in SAS and there's multiple ways to do things in R as well. Um, similar functionality um, for like the proc format. Um, what is the use case of that, right? So formatting in SAS can be achieved through proc format. Um, and then those, those formats that you define um, and reference in later later uh, data steps um, uh, can be stored in the SAS catalog for later use. Um, so we can, in, in that sense, we can define the length of each variable um, through like the data step statement, um, and then we can go through like lot of logical iterations of like if then statements to like perform calculations on given variables that we desire. Right. So. Um, an easy example of that I, that I just wrote for for this is is proc format. We have values. We have the value one uh, for a positive example of, of, of the variable class, right? Um, and, that, and then that value should be referenced as positive instead. Um, then we have zero and that should be referenced as like negative, right? So record, recoding variables in this sense uh, is kind of like the utility function for SAS or for the proc format, just for this basic example. Um, and that'll kind of carry over to like what, what we're referencing here in the course. Um, so the formatter package, right? So all lowercase FMTR, um, and this helps format your data and it kind of replicates like a, a similar functionality that would um, that you would get from like your, your prop format statements in SAS. Um, this package is part of like the SASI, SASI <laughs> uh, package. Uh, so it's actually all lowercase. Uh, I just, I, I like that reference. Um, and it provides some useful functionality with, it, with, it, with your data as well. So. Um, common functions are fdata, fapply, uh, the formats, um, f, f attribute, so f a t t r, f attribute, um, the value, uh, condition functions, um, f cat, f list. Um, essentially, what we'll be focusing on in this course is kind of like the f apply and the f attribute. Uh, this is the basic functionalities for the examples provided. So the f apply function um, is to apply formatting to like any given data vector, right? So uh, so we wanted to like uh, shorten like the length of like the output of like decimal precision, right? So we, we can define that within the F apply. Um, and then like the F attribute, right? We'll assign an attribute of, of a given uh, uh, object um, in R and it'll, it'll kind of like give it its own um, um, parameter called an attribute, right? So you can, you can essentially assign an attribute of like format um, and then kind of reference that format within, within um, um, uh, the object itself. So if you wanted to apply that format, you would just do like the F apply and you already have that format within, within the object itself as, as twisting as that sounds. Um, and then uh, the, the bottom point, uh, the F cat. Um, so we'll, we'll look at an example here of like kind of creating our own catalog for formatting and, and referencing that for later use um, as well. Okay, uh, let me just get a quick see.
Okay. So this is the formatter package. This is the F apply example. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just creating a sample vector called sample.b. Um, and we're concatenating those arguments here. Um, and you can see all, all of the um, uh, precision of these decimal points are, are different, right? So they vary a little bit here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take that value from um, um, the SASE package, um, the function f apply. Um, we're going to apply that on our sample data set, and we're just going to specify that we only want to see one decimal point uh, for the output, right? Um, so it can have as many leading integers as possible, so the wildcard symbol or percentage, and then we have a specified uh, floating format there. Um, and you can see the output is 6.4, 7.6, 1.1, and uh, 5.7. Um, so that kind of like will round the data up to the appropriate decimal precision um, based on the data set. It's a useful functionality for quickly applying different formats. And there are like um, uh, like S apply and L apply in, in R as well. So those are also different ways to approach this, but the, these are kind of like common ways to utilize like packages um, within, within R that can kind of replicate uh, saved formatting, right? So the real thing is like saving your format, right? You can create a whole script for that, or you can create a catalog that others can reference um, for whatever formatting they would want. Um, okay, so the, the formatter package um, also comes with the F apply example. So um, here's kind of what, like what I was talking about earlier, right? So we're gonna create a sample vector to format. Um, we're just kind of like gonna take that same example uh, vector that we have earlier. Um, we're going to assign uh, a format um, attribute in the sense. So we're going to call the, the attribute function. Um, and then we're going to say, we're going to take our vec vector here, um, sample V, and we're going to apply a format to it. Um, and what we're going to put in that format is the one, uh, the wild card, and then the point 0.1 decimal precision as well. And then finally, we're going to take the F apply function and apply that to our vector, um, where we can kind of see that like the output is, again, what we, what we expect. Um, of a single decimal point and as many leading um, whole values as possible. And this will kind of bring us into the, uh, the F attribute example. Um, so if we want to send like multiple attributes um, or multiple formatting attributes to, um, or just any given attribute, I guess, to, um, well, in, in a formatting sense, right? They don't have to be uh, numerically based. Um, so you can kind of see like, on, on row two, um, so that line of code, right? We have format and then we have width and then we have justify. So th those are all different examples of how you would format um, like a given data output, right? Um, so what we did here is we assigned uh, a sample vector of those numeric values again. <laughs> uh, we took the F um, attribute, so the FATTR, and then we applied, um, we, we passed in uh, the data set or the sample vector that we have above. Um, and the formatting, we have our, our format for a decimal precision of again, one decimal place. However, in this, in this case, we're also passing in uh, the width. So we're specifying the width of how long each output can be. And then we're justifying that output to the right. So we can justify it to the center and have spaces on equal sides. But the, for this example, it's, it's the extreme right. Um, when we call that f apply function to our sample vector, we see that there's a lot of padding to the left. Um, when there's additional spaces um, with, within our width, right? So that kind of comes from all these, these attributes that we defined um, with, the, with the F attribute um, function. So you can see we have five spaces here and then all the variables are shifted over to the right on their output. The formatter package also comes with a useful functionality for recoding. Um, so you recall earlier on the proc format example, um, we noticed that we were trying to recode some, some basic examples of like positive and negative um, to zero and one. Um, that can also be re reproduced in um, reproduced through the formatter package. And, it, and it's pretty easy to reproduce this to, to a whole data set if you would desire as well too. So um, the quick functionality here is useful. Um, and we're gonna take another vector here. Uh, we're just gonna call this sample.b2. Um, and then we're gonna pass a bunch of strings to it. Um, and then we're gonna create a second vector uh, that's gonna be called our lookup vector. Um, and this, this can kind of uh, uh, be a little bit, um, it, it can be a little, a little bit more convenient, I guess, on larger data sets, but for this example, we're focusing on a smaller one. Um, so we're gonna take our lookup uh, v2 example, um, and then we're gonna, again, concatenate all these arguments using our C function. Um, we're gonna define the legend that we have. So in this example, we're gonna say A is now equal to group A with a space between group and A. Same thing for B and then C, so group B, group C. Um, and now we're gonna apply that lookup uh, to the sample vector that we, were, um, we originally created using the F apply function. So we can see we have f apply. Um, we took our sample uh, v2 vector, 
And then we apply the lookup function that we have. Um, and then it'll generate the output automatically for you right there. Um, but if we want to assign that to like a different object or something, we could. Um, so there's different ways to go about it. But for this example, you can see like now the, now the vector output that we have from sample A um, uses the indices, matches up with the according value, and it'll output the um, appropriate group for the assignment with the new uh, recoded values. Okay. Um, so this one gets a little bit more complicated. We're not going to touch up too much on this in the course, um, but just for a programmatic example, um, the F cat. So the F cat will reproduce similar functionality to the uh, SAS catalog. So if you're looking to store um, um, formatting attributes or formatting, um, uh, well, there's different ways to format your data. I guess you can say uh, this is this is the way how you would approach it. Um, so for this example, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a sample data for, uh, uh, formatting catalog. Uh, so you can see, like, I have it, I have it entitled as date.format, uh, but it also has like a numeric format in there as well. Um, and then we're going to reference the F catalog. Um, so we have our number format, um, um, which you can see here. Uh, so this is the single decimal precision with as many leading wildcards. Uh, it's just excluding the one there, but the same output. Um, and then we have um, date format, um, which which is just like the standard definition of like how you would format dates here. Um, for for more like date formatting, uh, Luber dates like a good package to use for uh, R. Um, there are a lot of cheat sheets about how to uh, format some of your data, uh, but for this example, I, I formatted the data in the most common way that I, I've seen in pharmaceutical industry, which is uh, the output at the bottom of your screen, where we have uh, day day month 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 and then year 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 year, um, which is this. Uh, code here. Um, so then we're going to write that uh, catalog that we just defined out um, to our given directory. Um, so you can see like we have write.fcat. So now um, we've created this object uh, with our formatting um, using the f catalog. So now we have we have a catalog defined within the date.format um, object. Um, and then we're going to write that out to our directory. Um, that's all this code says is we use the write.f.cat function um, after, we've after we've defined the catalog and we output it to our directory. If we're looking to use that format for a later use case, right, the read.fcat uh, format, uh, just a basic line of code, um, it'll read in the example and you can see there are two formats within this data set, right? So we have the single decimal precision and then we have a type of um, uh, date formatting as well. And the, these are the uh, values for the given variables here. So it's entitled num, underscore, num underscore format um, and then date underscore format for the two variables. Just a quick example here. Um, if you call the sys.date function, it'll just bring you out the date. Uh, so this is when this code is written. Um, and then we can apply that using the f apply. Um, so we've read in our data, we've read in our catalog, um, and we're going to take in our system date and we're going to apply the date format that we desired, which is again, uh, month or day, day, month, 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 year, 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 or four years. Um, and then now the output comes as a string here. Um, so that's useful when you, when you have larger data sets as well. Um, and you just want to quickly apply that to a given column. Um, and references for later use cases for uh, some of your other work colleagues as well. Okay. So, 503, I think we're still okay on time. Um, so now we're going to open up the example, I think it's called formatter. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, so and again, we just cleared um, um, our environment up here, so we have we have a nice clean window uh, to work with. I'm just going to expand this out a little bit, so we have um, um, we have more room to see the code. Um, and then again, let's make sure that we have our SASE package installed from the installation package.r. And for this example, we only need to reference the formatter package, so we're just going to reference that now. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and just like execute some, some of these vectors that I may need. Oh, I've already defined it. Oh, we can just scroll down then. We just need the reference for the, um, the library. Okay, cool. So we're going to read in the exercise, uh, dot V, uh, format, uh, vector. Um, and then you can see like the precision here. So there's a large, um, difference between like some of the values. Um, 
So uh, what we're going to want to do here um, is essentially um, assign this a given format, right? So we want to call that we want to call the um, attribute um, attribute uh, command. So what we're going to do is we're just going to call that attribute. Um, we're going to call in our exercise uh, dot v, uh, and then we're just going to call in uh, the format. So similar example that we have above. Um, we can just see uh, our attribute command up here. Um, we're gonna be replicating that code down here. Uh, so we wanna call that, and then we wanna point to it, and then we wanna say our percent. Oops. Actually, we wanna open up some strings quick. We wanna call our percent, and then we're gonna say one, and then period, and then two, and then we're gonna reference our F. And then we're gonna hit um, control enter for there, make sure we're all good on their execution. Um, and now we're going to apply that using the F apply. So all we're going to call is F apply. And then we're going to call in our, um, our sample vector from there. And you can see the output defined below. Um, we just have two decimal points for our desired output. And there are more examples here. These, this is the entire example throughout the slide uh, with your formatting catalog as well. Um, so if you need any, if you have any questions with like the coding there, uh, the references to are right above. Um, and then we're just going to save that again, just because. All right, and now we're just going to clear these, clear our objects, and then clear our screen. And if you guys have any trouble with like executing some of the code, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm fairly confident my, my TAs can help too. <laughs> okay. All right. So this will bring us into a little bit of data exploration. Um, and starting off with like data exploration here is like, all I have is like a box plot and you can see there's a lot of variability between the values here. So um, uh, not the best visual, but just for examples. Um, so the SG plot can be used to define like a variety of plots. Um, so that can be used for like histograms. I'd also use it for like rank. Uh, there's like a proc rank essentially. And then I'm gonna be using that to like um, kind of plot my visuals after I, after I get those out of there. Um, so, um, the main thing that I use to plot data, I would say in SAS is, is proc SG plot. Um, a basic example here that you can see to the right is uh, we, have our, we have our proc procedural statement, we have our data that we're referencing, uh, and then we just have the VBOX reference um, over our category. Um, then we run that, execute that command. So visualizing data in R is a little bit more, um, I would say intuitive, right? So um, the visuals in SAS are, are a bit limited for like what the output's desired and the ODS statement um, can only do so much sometimes. <laughs> um, but visualizing a data is a little bit more free flowing. Um, you're allowed to manipulate things a little bit uh, easier. Um, and the, there is a little bit of like a followed structure here, um, but the main, main package that gets used the most often for visualizing data is called ggplot2. Um, there's ggplot1 as well, uh, but the new standard is through ggplot2. Um, and for this example, for the visualized data, um, we discussed something called like the grammars of graphics. Um, and what that is, is just like a layered framework uh, to build visualizations. Um, so you'll create your output, like your, your uh, scatter plot, say, you'll, you'll apply a legend to the scatter plot, you'll apply like uh, labels to the scatter plot, and you'll finally define like a title for the scatter plot. Um, those are all made line by line sequence. Um, as opposed to SAS, where you have your you have your header and your footer, and you have like your title up top. So it's similar functionality there, um, but like you can define like font. You can, <laughs> it's a little bit more like free free flowing nature, I would say. Um, there's no no limitations um, for the most part. Um, and yeah, so this is implemented in R uh, with ggplot2. Um, so we went through the layerization process of the visualizing. Um, so like starting with the data set, things like axes, labels, points, uh, groupings are added one at a time. Um, it seems not intuitive, but like it, I, I, I think I take a similar approach when I'm when I'm creating outputs in SAS. So if I want to make sure it looks good first, and then I'll, I'll add in the labels and references where I need to. Um, generally, the labels in SAS are um, your axes of your variables, and and R will follow that similar functionality. Um, before you overwrite them with like a label um, label function in like SAS and like a label function in R as well. Okay, um, so just a basic example of this. Um, we're going to be looking at the Star Wars data set. 
Um, so this is, and again, an example data set that's provided. Um, uh, you can just reference it using the Star Wars data, Star Wars um, in semicolons. So all those packages that you've installed, uh, they all come with like, or most of them come with like data uh, within, within their packages as well that you can use for later. Um, and for this example, we're gonna be going through like some of the pipe syntax and the filtration there. Um, Um, so, so uh, for the for this example, we have the human droid. Uh, we're, we're looking at our Star Wars data set. Uh, so the human droid being our object, we're looking at our Star Wars data set, um, and then uh, we're filtering that down <laughs> for species um, that contain the values human and droid, right? And then we're going to drop all NAs um, from height and mass. Um, so to kind of perform that, uh, the example below is uh, first we specify the data set and the x y uh, variables that we want. Um, and you can see like we have our Star Wars plot now, um, and then we're going to take our ggplot function, uh, we're going to reference our data, which is the human droid object now, so we, we have a subset of data set, um, and then we're going to apply some aesthetics to it, so AES is, is short for aesthetics. Um, and for this example, the aesthetics are going to be our x variable, um, which is defined as height, our y variable, which is defined as mass, um, and then we can continue adding um, like titles and axes and like um, other things like that. So we have we have our geom point here. So this will reference the actual scatter point plot. Um, so without like the type of plot that you referenced, um, we have our data and then we have the plot that we would be creating from there, right? So we we saw like a V box um, from from SAS. This is this is the same thing as like uh, a V box reference, but a geom point meaning scatter scatter plot in this scatter point. Um, and then the aesthetics we're applying to that um, is gonna be color, right? So we're gonna look at the color of each individual species. So that'll be the legend that we have. Um, and then we'll just simply apply a title, a ggplot title. Uh, it'll be mass versus height for humans and droids. Um, and then we're gonna be applying our labels to our x-axis, which are height um, and mass. <clears throat> and then we're gonna uh, finally print out our output. Um, so you can see like, this is what the visualization looks like. Um, so, I mean, there's not a lot of going on for droid. Uh, we, have, we have a good amount of clustering going on for human um, and, and some, some extreme outliers. But for the most part, this visual is pretty sufficient for like what you're looking at. Um, you can go into a little bit more deep diving um, for visualizing in, in R. Um, but for the most part, like I provided the ggplots um, script for you. So if you're interested in seeing how to perform any type of visualization, um, you can reference that code. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, proc freak. So, proc freak. What can it do? Um, and what are the limitations? Right. So, it has a, it has an abundance of like output statistics that you could possibly get, um, and it can be used for a variety of for functions. Um, so, proc freak. Um, it's most commonly used to summarize data, right? So you get count, you get cumulative function, you can run a chi-square out of there, like from your observers, it's expected. Um, but essentially it'll just provide a summary table with counts and frequencies um, and cumulative frequencies of given categorical variable. Um, so for this example, um, uh, I just written this little code, uh, proc freak, um, we're referencing our COVID data set and we're just ordering that by the data that we have. Um, the table and tables references, they're used a little bit interchangeably, um, but the, for this example, we're just doing uh, gender by uh, payout group, and then we're just performing that execution. This is kind of what the output would look like um, without any title, title or anything like that. Um, so you can see we have our frequency error percent, uh, the row percentage and our column percentage, <clears throat> just from our payer group relative to our female or relative to the, the gender. Um, and then you can see we have subtotals on the bottom as well. Um, so that'll bring us into the Arsenal package. Um, so this is another package that's very useful um, when um, doing a lot of like SAS to R uh, programming. And uh, it, it replicates a lot of different functionality uh, that SAS produces. There's six main functions uh, that it'll reproduce. Um, and those are kind of listed below. So we have uh, our, our table by uh, function. So that essentially summarizes a set of independent variables by one or more categorical variables. Um, we have our paired um, function, essentially it'll summarize a set of independent variables across two time points. Um, and we have our model sum function, which is used to fit and summarize models for each independent variable with one or more response variables. So that's like the multiple response output that you're looking for. Um, and then we have our freak, li freak list, 
which is used to approximate the output from SAS's proc freak. Um, we have compared data frame or DF um, that compares two data frames and reports um, differences between them. Um, that's similar to the proc compare. I, I haven't found myself using proc compare since like, uh, I guess base, base level, very, very base level. Um, so I don't know how useful that one would be, but it's, it's, it's there if you need it. Um, but one that's very useful is the right to, um, and then the asterisk isn't part of the syntax. It's just like uh, used as the wildcard symbol here. But that will provide a bunch of functionality that um, allows you to kind of output those data tables that you've created, right? So uh, that'll replicate kind of the ODS deliverable that you're looking for in, um, in R relative to SAS. Um, so, so the ones that we're going to focus on mainly for this course, um, for these examples at least, are going to be the table by, um, and then we're going to do the freak list, and then we'll, we'll output that and see how it looks. Okay. So this is the Arsenal package, and this is the freak list example. Um, so we again, we just add our library reference there. Uh, we read in the data set there. Uh, we're checking our data set, right? So this this is what it kind of looks like. Um, if we see, and we've seen the COVID data set a little bit, but uh, mainly mainly what we're focusing on here are kind of like those categorical variables that we could potentially use. Um, so continuation of like the freak list example, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the freak list function to define a table, right? So you can see uh, up here. Uh, we have a table function. So we're creating a table in the background and assigning that to a given object. And then we can kind of call the freak list example to get the summaries of those tables. So you can see like we have the summary function in, in R, um, but the summary function is generally used to give summarizations of like data frames and tibbles, right? Here it's being used a little bit different. Um, so just like walking through the code, we assign a table. Uh, what we hear is what we do here is we reference the, the data frame that we're using. So in the sense COVID, um, and then we're going to reference the comparison, uh, the comparator, I guess you want to call it, uh, which is in this sense result. So COVID positive or COVID negative. Uh, and then we're going to kind of compare that those values against demo group and gender. So these are both two categor categorical variables as well as comparing that to like a result variable. Um, what this will do is it'll help you kind of like find if there's any odd distributions within your data set, right? So uh, when you're fitting some models, like some preliminary work, that's very useful is seeing how the data is distributed across uh, multiple levels of your data. Um, I think this is a great way to approach it. Um, maybe you will too. Um, so again, uh, we're going to assign the output um, of the frequency list to a new object, and we're going to call frequency list. We're going to call that table we just created from above here. Um, and then uh, for we, we have the option here. Uh, to target how we approach NAs, right? So those, those values that just aren't reported, right? And for this example, we're just gonna include those. Um, and then we're just gonna print out the output. And you can see this is kind of like what the output looks like. Um, so we have a result, we have our demo group and we have the levels of each group. We have our gender and we have uh, the levels of those groups as well. We have the frequency of every level and sub-level of all these categorical variables defined in the frequency. And then we again have the summary of the cumulative frequency of each, each value based on count. As you can see, we have 17, we have 8, 25. Um, and then we have the percentage of the total um, values in the data frame itself. Um, so you can see like there's large clusters going on for patient, female, and male um, for this given gender group, the negative. Um, and then we have the cumulative frequency going on, uh, which, which is kind of like a running total to the right. Very useful function. Okay, so we're going to go through a little bit of a programming example here. And then we'll kind of touch up on modeling a little bit of some data. I intended this course to run about two hours. Uh, we might go a little bit over, um, but hopefully you learned a little bit something here. All right. So let's close this. And the next example I have is freak list example is the name of it, this one. Okay. Okay. We're clear here. And we just want to make sure we have our reference. Uh, we want to read in this COVID data set again. Because, I mean, I, we clear our variables. <laughs> uh, we'll just check the structure of it. And if we just wanted to check like a printout of, of these values uh, from the previous example, we can just see how it would look um, within our window here. All right, so onto the exercise. Um, so we're going to create a table. Um, essentially, we're going to call this like my first table. Um, And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be referencing um, our COVID data study. Um, 
And then what we're going to be doing from there is we're going to be opening up some brackets. Um, we're going to be referencing this, and we are going to take in the result. Um, so essentially, kind of like what you're looking at up here, um, you can kind of use that for reference as well. Um, and what we want is we want the result, and we want the responses based on payer group. Um, so payer group. Oops. And we're going to use gender as the other category. And then we're just going to submit that. And everything looks good there. Um, so for the second step, we're going to look to define our uh, freak, freak list. We're going to call that function now. Um, and then we're going to call this my first freak list. Um, and then we're going to pass through the freak list. And then we're going to pass in my first table. And you can see like this will auto complete for you. And we're just going to leave the NA options. Um, And we're just gonna leave this as remove. And then we're gonna submit that. And now we're just gonna print out our um, a summary of the, the data table or the frequency list that we created. And then we're just gonna execute that. And this is this would be an example of how you would create um, this output. Um, so essentially what we did with our table was we defined a table um, of result, uh, payer group, and gender. Um, and then we define a frequency list of that. And for this example, we've removed the NA options. Um, so a little bit, a little bit different um, from what we saw above, um, but we can see the output is very convenient, neat, and um, kind of useful, right? All right. All right. So hop back over here. Um, actually, let me. All right, so this is the last segment I have for the course. Um, we're gonna go through uh, one more example um, and then I'll kind of walk through just how you would approach just like a general linear model um, in R. So there's different ways to approach modeling um, as far as like the procedures that you're gonna be using. Um, so I think in SAS, there's a proc logistic. Um, there's also a proc GLM um, that can be used for kind of like logistic regression and stepwise. Um, we're going to go through the, the GLM uh, function in R um, at the end, and uh, we're going to go through some stepwise using the uh, AIC as the standard for uh, model reduction in, in and out um, for each given parameter, which is pretty common um, in this case. Okay, so uh, coming back to the Arsenal package, again, they're very useful, has a lot of functionality. Um, let's take a look at the COVID data set again um, and see like if we wanted to test um, like an explanatory variable um, levels uh, to response variable result, um, like the following results would kind of like work, right? So um, this will give you like relative to the distribution of, of the variable you're looking at in comparison, is there any significance from given levels or given variables itself? Um, so it's a little bit more detailed, um, but it'll, it'll essentially fit a model. And like what you're looking at by this table by function is like we define output, we have table by, we have the result that we're interested in, uh, which is in this case result, so the response variable here. Um, and then this little tilde here um, generally is the use case for like I'm building a model in R. Um, so to throw everything at it, uh, we would just remove like patient class and gender and put a period, um, and that would throw in all of your variables in the data set. But for this example, we're looking at a table by, we're, we're just looking at categorical variable comparison relative to like the distribution of each categorical variable. Um, so we're looking at result and then we're comparing like the initial uh, uh, patient class and gender values um, within the COVID data set. Um, then we're just gonna print out um, the summary of this, this data as well. So this is kind of what the output looks like. Um, you can see it's a little bit different um, from the frequency list example that we saw. However, excuse me, something that you can notice is that we do have a, a level of statistical significance within our, within these data within these um, parameters here. Um, and we, I mean, you, the use case scenario for this is, um, right, like, why would this be significant, right? So we can see why gender is insignificant, right? The distributions are fairly straightforward throughout, like they're just level throughout the entire variable itself. 
Um, but here, like we have some subsets, right? So like this little subset here, right? The inpatient could be used to define like the, the significance, right? Like relative to like uh, the entire distribution or like we have 15.8% here for emergency, right? So those, those values that you wanna highlight are the differences between the layers of each individual group. And that kind of will indicate whether or not there's significance within the variance uh, when defining a model, right? Um, for as far as like coefficient weights go. Um, so, so for me, like, I, I think this is very useful for like exploratory and looking at like um, kind of significance of the levels of, of categorical variables that you see. Um, yeah. And then there's ways also to define like the threshold, like the confidence um, as far as like the p-value goes as well. So um, those are those are within the package. And I, mean, I recommend if you're interested in like defining your own alpha, you can uh, look into that as well. Okay. Um, so the final thing from the Arsenal package that I wanted to touch up on this class is, is something that's pretty useful. It's just, it's, it's similar to the ODS output in SAS. Um, it's, it's the um, right to family of functions. Um, so the right to family of functions includes HTML, Word, and uh, PDF um, for output tables. So again, only for output tables, um, if you're looking to kind of like create like an output from, from your R code, um, a better solution in most cases is going to be using Markdown. Um, but if you're looking for like quick outputs of like tables uh, and you're already in the Arsenal package, this is just easy to reference and, and kind of output for for anybody else that's looking to look at your look at your uh, data analysis. Um, so for this, let's look at an example of like the write to PDF function, um, and it's a very simple command, right? So we saw our output table table from above, right? So we have we have the summary of the output for this table right here. Um, and then all we're going to do is we're going to call the write to, and then the number two, and then PDF. We're going to define the output table that we specified from before, and then the pathway that we defined it to. And I mean, don't mind the uh, parentheses here as the naming convention. You can name it whatever you would like. And if we're looking here, uh, we can see all the way at the bottom, um, we have the output table from PDF. Um, so that's kind of like what, what it would look like when it's showing up in your given directory. Um, and then now we're just going to go through a quick walkthrough of the table by. Um, so if we want to just open up that code. And you can see I have a reference here for the library R markdown. Um, just make sure everything's. We have a reference here for the library uh, R markdown. Um, the R markdown package is going to be needed to create that uh, functionality of, um, of the right to family functions here. Um, so what we're going to want to do is we're just going to reference both of these, um, and then we'll read in our COVID data set. Um, and then we can just print that out just to make sure everything looks good. Um, all right. So, uh, what we're going to do here is, is again, we're going to kind of like replicate what we have going on up here. So if you need any code to reference from there, um, essentially we're not going to be changing too, too much here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to call this output two. Um, we're going to reference that, um, and then we're going to call the table by function. So we're going to go through the table by. Um, what we're going to want to do is we're going to create a result. We're going to put in this tilde expression. Um, oops, can't really see. And then we're interested in patient class and demo group. So we're going to pass in through the patient class, and we add an a plus sign to reference additional variables um, when we're modeling, um, similar to how you would create a formula for coefficients, just think of this tilde as like the equal sign, right? Um, so we're gonna go to the demo group. Um, and then we just wanna make sure that we reference the COVID data set. And that should be good to go. And you can see uh, we do have our output there, um, which is the list of three. Um, and now we're just gonna check a summary uh, of the output two. And we're just going to set this text equal to true. And you can see we have our output that we desire. You can see there's significance in both of these, which is great. That's what you like to see. Um, and now all we're going to do is we're going to use the right to HTML. Um, the reason for that is because uh, we want to see what the output looks like, maybe outside of the RStudio console, right? Uh, or IDE. So we're going to use the right to, and then we're going to call the HTML. And then we're just going to call our output two. And then we're just going to reference this as like output 
to um, I don't know, underscore HTML. Oops, typo. All right, and once this executes, you can see uh, when it does call it, um, well, you can see we have we have the R markdown reference here. Um, so packages built within packages add for exclusive, maybe like uh, a little bit of a niche functionality. Uh, and this, this does provide that a little bit, but when, when you're writing some SAS code, um, something that's kind of like, I guess that it, it was almost missing a little bit, right? It was just that quick, um, same package in and out, um, functionality. And the two packages that I've seen that kind of like do the most are, are the SASE package, um, that's a little bit more advanced, um, as far as functionality goes, but the Arsenal package is again very, very useful for um, just providing some quick insight on your data sets, um, similar functionality as far as like categorical data is concerned. Um, and yeah, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at the output to here, the HTML. Um, you can see it has two dot HTMLs here. Uh, we're just going to hit the view in web browser. Um, and this is kind of what the output looks like, right? So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, if you wanted to kind of like send this file to somebody, they could just open it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a quick reference for somebody else looking at your data. Um, and it allows for like pretty easy uh, sharing, I would say. Okay. All right. Let me just clear this. All right. So. I don't know how teachers do it. Sipping water all day. All right. So for a basic example of like logistic regression, and here we're not going to go through like the training and test sets. We're just going to go through like how you would fit like a basic model of your data um, using like the GLM procedure or uh, <laughs> uh, function. Sorry. Uh, so like let's look at the breast cancer data set. Um, I provided that that data set for you, but you can just kind of like look on the screen to see like what. It, So Ann Reiner asked, um, and everybody can kind of see that in the, the chat, uh, sorry for calling out your name, but uh, the output uh, to HTML function. So um, they work with specifically tables. Um, so if you're creating like any type of table, as long as you utilize that table function, so we saw a table and then the parentheses, anything within inside that, uh, you can actually utilize the, um, the write to family function. So write to HTML for this example or like write to Word or write to PDF. Um, as long as it's within a table, it can be used. Um, but if it's not, um, you're gonna need to use some like different functionality um, for like those desired outputs. Um, but pretty much like anything that you're looking to do, I recommend using R Markdown first. Um, that gets a little bit more complicated um, as far as like saving your results, but uh, there are some simple commands if you're not looking to format data too much uh, or format your output too much that are, are pretty basic to use. Um, and there's some nice resources on CRAN for that. Um, if you're looking to create like a full on report, um, I'd probably recommend using like the SASE package called Reporter. Um, that allows you to really, uh, I guess, nitpick um, how you justify tables and stuff like that. But there's a lot of functionality for like outputting your data. Um, this is just the most convenient for tables only. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. All right. So um, going back to like the logistic regression, um, this is again like the final example we have for the class. Um, we're just going to look at the breast cancer data set and we want to perform like a binary fit to the response variable called class, right? So in this case, um, benign or malignant, right? Um, we can see that on the bottom here. Um, and then we have like a bunch of variables. We have ID, um, thickness, cell size, cell shape, um, adhesion, um, just like a bunch of variables. I would say like looking at it right now, uh, just from like a broad standpoint, right? We, we don't really need ID. Um, that's, that's a variable that we're not super interested in. Um, um, maybe even mitosis. Um, I can't really tell too much about the layering of that system. Um, if there's enough levels, right, like we could kind of like dummy that variable a little bit. So um, add levels to like, hopefully recreate like a little bit better of analysis out of it. Um, but for the most part, we, we really don't need ID, right? Um, and, and for like executing like binary response uh, modeling in R, um, you're gonna kind of need to do um, 
uh, recoding of variables. So like class um, is all strings, so benign and malignant. Um, we're gonna need to recode those um, to numeric values, so zero or one. Um, Okay. So something that's useful when you're when you're modeling data is right. We want to print out them. We want to print out the data, and then we want to see like summary statistics of the data. Um, if you want to see like more descriptive summary statistics of like data sets, um, I I use the psych package a little bit when I'm when I need some a little bit more detailed um, summary statistics. So instead of the summary function, you would just use uh, a function called describe, um, and then just put in your data set within that. Um, it'll create a similar output with like a little bit, not better, I would say, but um, some, some more advanced statistics, such as like kurtosis or skewness um, that you'll see. All right. So, um, so this is a basic example of like how you would model your data. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, assign a general model um, called GLM fit. Um, we're going to Again, point to what we're assigning, um, and we're going to assign we're going to assign this using the GLM function, so general linear model function. And I know what you're thinking: linear model. Uh, this is a binary response, right? Essentially, we're building a categorical model. But kind of what dictates what dictates how you approach your model um, is is this family function. Um, so, like, we can do a family of like binomial. We can do a Poisson distribution. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there's there like a bunch of different like modeling techniques I guess you can approach it with um, but uh, for the most part the general linear model uh, can kind of like take in a lot of different types of data sets that you're looking to model for like a single given response and the same thing in SAS proc GLM um, same type of deal um, so what we're going to do here is we want to pass in class because we want to start off with with uh, what's our response right and recall earlier we have our tilde and then we have a period here um, so this will kind of just say, we're going to throw everything at it. Um, we're just going to throw everything in the model, see how it works out. Uh, I, not the best approach, but I mean, I, I know we've all done that at least one time, <laughs> uh, just to get a basic fit. Um, and then we're going to call our data step here. Um, so we have data equals breast cancer uh, for this data set example. Um, and then essentially, we're going to be uh, checking the summary of that fit. Um, so like, what, what are the statistics that come out from this model, right? Um, just from a basic level. So this is kind of like what the, what the output would look like from that summary statistic, right? So something that's kind of useful. Um, sec. Something that's kind of useful that you'll see is like we have our deviance of our residuals here. Um, so that's a very useful statistics, right? Um, we can see we have a, like a large spread um, between the min and max. I mean, it's not horrible, but not great, um, especially for like a zero or a one classification. <laughs> uh, and we can look at our individual parameters, right? So our coefficients here. So here are their weights um, and the given estimate. Um, and then we have our standard error. Uh, we have the Z value, and then we just have like the confidence level relative to Z. So, right, like how, how much, how significant is this relative to the distribution of, of the response variable? Um, and you can see on the bottom, we have the significance codes. Um, so like zero is given three asterisks, uh, 0 0.001. So that's what, like a 99.9% and then 99 and then 95 and then 90 uh, for alpha levels. And then we, we have one. Um, so this is kind of just like the scale that you'll see. Um, so we also have some additional statistics that we see. Um, this is like the null deviance, um, the residual deviance, um, and we have our degrees of freedom. Um, so we also have 16 observations that are deleted uh, just because they were missing. <laughs> um, and then we, we see we have our final output right here. Um, so generally when you're modeling, right, we have our AIC score um, that's used for kind of like measuring how effective the model is. Um, a lower score is a better score um, is the gist of it. And this is the amount of iterations it took to, to go through the scoring iteration of like this AIC. Um, so this, this just built a basic model. This didn't go through removing any of the parameters. This is the best fit relative to the best weights that we've defined. That makes sense. Um, and you'd like, generally we wanna see um, like low standard error, uh, confidence in our estimate, the intercept better be pretty good, um, but we wanna have confidence in most of our parameters um, or else we can kind of remove those. 
if we just wanted to check like the coefficients of our variable, right? Um, so something that's easy to reference here um, is, is the command coef, um, so C-O-E-F. Um, and then we're just gonna pass through the model that we just fit, known as the GLM fit. Um, you can see we have an intercept here. So we have a negative 10. Um, and then we can see the weights of each individual variable. So like maybe thickness and, and mitosis are kind of related, right? Maybe they share some covariation there uh, because the weights are relatively close um, and in the same direction as well. <laughs> uh, so, so you can kind of like gauge how your model is performing here um, in, in the relative fit. Um, and that, that's kind of all I had for um, this course. Um, uh, the basic example I provided in uh, the logistic regression example, uh, if we want to just run through that quick. Uh, oh, there's a useful command in here called column names. Um, sometimes when you're iterating through columns, um, it's just useful to execute that. Uh, we have our head function here. Uh, here are the summary statistics that we created. Here's what I was talking about from removing variables in the data set that were not really needed, right? So I just went through and I looked at it and I said, we definitely don't need ID because that's not gonna do anything for our model. It's just like this value that's creating variance uh, that's not useful. So that can get removed. And like, if we just highlight this, um, this value, uh, we can see that there's no longer ID in this model. Um, and then uh, something that you'll notice Recall earlier, I mentioned that, um, again, like we're just fitting like a basic model here. But recall earlier, what I said is like, we need the response variable to be uh, binary and numeric in nature, um, or else it won't, it won't uh, classify these accordingly. Um, so when I go to execute this code, um, with this data set just minus the ID variable, um, I'm given this error, right? And as you would use SAS to kind of um, understand your issue, um, or like how the program executed, right? Sometimes you're given a bunch of warnings um, when it's iterating through, especially um, model building. Um, but you can see like the Y values must be uh, equal or equal to or greater than um, zero and then less than or equal to one, right? So for binary classification, especially with like a binomial, right? <laughs> um, that needs to be numeric and how we would change these and recode these values. Um, yeah, that'd be useful to kind of just go through some iterations here. So um, if I just wanted to reference like the class variable um, for the breast cancer data set, right? So I'm gonna call the breast cancer data set. To call a column, you'll use this dollar sign. And you can see it'll list all the columns that I have. So um, if I wanted to just kind of like look at class, I can just do that. And it'll print out all the values of the class. You can see like, if I just wanted to print out like uh, the first few, right? Or something like that. Right, that's what it would look like. Um, so to reference a column, uh, what you'll be using is that dollar sign. So again, just like the breast cancer and then the dollar sign and then whatever, whatever column you're interested in. So that's how you would reference a column. And you can see in this code line, I have the data set, I have the reference here. Um, however, I have this additional code segment here. Um, and this is within brackets itself because when you're going to reference a value within the column you're referencing, you first reference the column and then you reference the value that it's within. Oops. So you can think of it like, I don't know if I'm looking at like a sandwich, right? Like I have, I have bread and then I also have bread. And then if I'm looking at like uh, the top of the sandwich, I have like tomato or something. And then like within that, I also have like a seed of the tomato. And say I want the seed, right? I need to reference this data set here. And then I need to reference what's within that. And then if I wanted to recode like seed to like no, no seed or something instead, um, I would need to kind of access that element. So in order to access that element and recode these values, um, we're gonna need to add the second layer. So same thing, we're gonna reference the data set, the column, so data set and then column, and then where that value is equal to. So you use the double equals there, um, and then for benign, it's zero, malignant for one. Um, so pretty much I'll go through and I'll recode these values. And then after we recode the value, um, this, this um, class column is still a, a string or a character. So it needs to be converted into a numeric data type. 
So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take the column that we have here with the recoded values from above. And then we're just gonna say as dot numeric, and then that'll convert the entire column as long as we reference it appropriately. Um, so we can do that here. And then we're just gonna head and check this. And then we're gonna fit our model. So now we have our model fit. We have our coefficients um, from here. And um, to execute an additional stepwise function, we're going to use this and then uh, the piping syntax again. Um, and then we're just going to call this function called step AIC. Um, and then we're going to, we don't necessarily need to know how it got there. So we're just going to turn that execution off. Um, so then if we execute that, we can go print this out. And then we can see we did improve on our AIC score by three. <laughs> uh, so not great. I mean, but we, we have our variables that are significant now, right? So that's kind of the important thing. Um, you can't always go by a single given score. You want to see like effectiveness of the variables, the weights of the coefficients, which we can see here. And you can see like, I mean, there is a little bit of like similarity between these weights, but I wouldn't say that like just eyeballing it, like, I mean, maybe uh, thickness and mitosis that there's not a significant amount of like co-variation between the residuals. I mean, obviously a little bit of deeper analysis would need to get performed for that, um, but just like, uh, weights that are according would be nice. Um, and it seems like we have an appropriate fit here. Um, oops. oops, sorry. So if we want to uh, check like our residuals too. So something that's useful is like, if I go to the GLM and reference the fit, um, then I hit like the dollar sign, that fit object has a bunch of values that like you may find useful, right? So we have weights, prior weights, uh, degrees of freedom and the residuals, or data frame that is null, um, y, converged values, the boundaries, NA actions, um, contrasts. <laughs> uh, they're just like a bunch of values that like we, we have, right? Um, and then we just have like a basic ANOVA here. Um, so you can kind of see that. Um, but like the statistics that you're looking for are generally available, um, essentially right after you fit a model. Um, if it's a good model, I mean, that's up to you a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, like people kind of rely on similar statistics. Um, but for this model that we've already built, um, I've assigned this object of the residuals um, from this fitted model. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna look at the summary and you can see there's something weird going on here, right? So like this minimum value, uh, we have minus 496, but like the rest of the values, like, I mean, maybe like the max that's, significantly different from like where we are in the center of like this distribution, right? Um, so maybe we just want to see that. And like a quick visual, like I, I always throw out just like a quick plot function. So like plot and then plot your residuals that you just have. And you can see like, I mean, for the most part, like this data lies like on a decent fit, right? There's nothing, there's no title here. There's no like indexes. We just have observations and then we have like the fit of the residuals. So we only have like one real outlier. I mean, I wouldn't be so concerned, I guess, with that is like a final output. Um, one one outlier within this entire data set. It's a relatively large data set at fifteen thousand rows. <laughs> um, okay, so it's kind of all I had. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess I want to thank you guys all for uh, coming to this course. Um, was, uh, I hope it was informative. Um, hope you have a question. Um, thank you, Joe, for, for the presentation. Sure. The, I'm in the process of transitioning from mainly SAS to R, and there are some days where I just want to do a quick, let's say, proc, uh, let me think, just a quick data, data function um, in SAS, and I'm trying to replicate that in R, but I just can't figure it out. So what resources do you have for someone that's needing to uh, replicate some of the SAS skills in R? Yeah, so the two best, uh, is this the right one? So these two books um, are like um, advanced R. Um, so this, this book is like, uh, hold on. Yeah, so this book is free. Um, there's also 
in our solution. So they, both of these will kind of like cover um, the basic analysis that you need. Um, maybe more so the advanced book, but I can put this in the chat. Um, there's there's more on this GitHub page. So if you like kind of explore like Hadley Wickham's like GitHub page, um, they'll give you like, like if you explore like this other books, um, this will help you with like your analysis for, um, so maybe, maybe that, that would even work, but this will help you with your analysis if you're looking to kind of like replicate anything in like R. Um, okay. It's like relative to SAS because it's not going to be a one to one thing, right? So I, I think there's a lot of uh, false perception on like kind of replicating analysis um, directly from like SAS to R. Um, do you have an idea of like what you were, you were looking to do, I guess? So, so, some things are not just analysis. So for, for example, today I was trying to just do a regular if else statement uh, in R. So I had to Google for a couple minutes to really figure out the exact way to do that in R. So I don't know if there was a book that existed out there that had, oh, here, you already know how to do this in SAS. This is how you would do it in R, just something like that. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's like the functional operand in this book, so that might be like kind of useful. Um, okay. I think like you, you really don't need to read the introductory one. So you can see like I've covered some of this stuff that's in this book, right? So like the functional programming run if, um, mm -hmm. like th these are just basic functions that are in the advanced book. But I would say this book, you can quickly reference it. It's free, to, free available online. I, I think for the most part, you're gonna probably use this a lot um, if you're looking for any R um, books, but uh, I think, uh, what was it, this book? Yeah, so I think this book's super popular. Um, and you'll probably use this a little bit more. So like a book I would recommend, um, I don't know, I can just show it to the camera, I guess. Um, okay. So the book is called An Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R. So this is more of like for the statisticians, um, but like this has been one of the most useful books that I've ever had, I guess. Um, let me just put the name of that too. Okay. But the, the reason why I recommend Hadley's book, um, um, obviously he wrote R, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's also accessible on a computer relatively quickly, right? right so right. like whenever I find myself like not understanding like some, some type of functionality, right? Like, you're gonna run into errors. I run into errors when I'm performing SAS. I run into errors when I'm performing R. Um, it happens. Um, if you need to know why, like your ability to bug is kind of like your main tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's not a one-to-one -one direct conversion, I would say. I would, I would find things that you find yourself using the most. Okay. And I, would, I would probably try to get like a little bit more um, in control with that. Like mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're creating a lot of looping functions in R2, I would just create like a templated script that you can reuse uh, for the most part. Um, because rewriting it, and you can see like, um, like rewriting it, like it, it, it's going to create some problems for you. Uh, I think, especially if for a new learner. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Cool. Um, let me. So this is by. Okay. So those are the authors. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Darren's right. So he's, yeah, Hadley was the like the main contributor, one of the main contributors to R. He wasn't the one who officially wrote it. Uh, R derived from S language, I believe. And I, I guess you can't attribute that to him. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, I like Darren a lot here. <laughs> but I hope you guys had some fun. Um, are there any more questions for the course? Um, I hope this is kind of insightful for you as well. All right. I guess with that, um, call it a day. Um, thank you all for coming to the course um, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you all for my TAs too, appreciate it.